Good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you are in. Welcome to the NATA operating in today's Part 135 Regulatory Environment Webinar. Our webinar is scheduled for one hour today. Everyone should be able to see the GoToWebinar interface. Um, you are all in a muted mode right now. If you would like to be able to ask a question later, please make sure you've entered the audio pin that's indicated on the interface. You can open or hide the doc panel using the uh, orange button there. If you do have questions, as I mentioned, you can raise your hand using that button or lower it if your question later is answered and, and you no longer need to be recognized. You can also, um, if it's easier, just type in a question in the uh, text box area and that will come to us at the staff and we will address all of the questions or at least as many as time permits at the end of the presentations. There should be three handouts available to you which all deal with information we'll be discussing today. If you have any problem with those handouts, they will also be available on the NATA coronavirus website. The webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the NATA website as well in case you want to come back and, and listen to it again or share it with others in your organization. I'll turn things over to uh, Ryan Wagesback to get us started. Well, good morning and afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us again to discuss uh, some very important 135 related issues. Um, Ryan Wagesback, Senior Vice President with NATA, and I am joined today with uh, David Hernandez, shareholder at Better Price, John McGraw, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at NATA, and Jackie Rosser, Senior Advisor of Regulatory Affairs also within ATA. So the agenda as follows, uh, we plan on discussing the CARES Act and 135 CARES, regulatory matters as it relates to this COVID-19 outbreak and employee matters. Lastly, we will have uh, an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation and our email addresses will be provided. So please email us if your question does not get answered or if you have further follow-up. Uh, David, let's get started. Okay, thank you, Ryan, um, and, and, and good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, it's, it's certainly a, a crazy time, and uh, I applaud NATA for doing this. I mean, the, the goal of this whole thing is to get the, the word out and keep our folks, our employees employed, and I think the government's doing a great job, but, you know, we all know how difficult it is. I'm working with clients filling out these applications for the... Uh, Air Care Worker Support Program, Small Business Program, and it's a very trying time. So I would just say thank you for everybody for being diligent and uh, getting out here and applying for this stuff and showing an interest. So first and foremost, you know, I'm going to talk about the Air Carrier Worker Support Program. Um, and what that is, that is a specific program, Section 4112 of the CARES Act, that provides for the Secretary of Transportation, and you can sit the slide there, right? You can move the slide. Uh, next slide. There we go. Thank you. Um, so it provides a large amount of money, a massive amount of money, uh, roughly $25 billion or $25 billion for air carriers, passenger air carriers, $4 billion for cargo air carriers, and $3 billion for contractors. And obviously what we care about here on this call is passenger air carriers. Uh, the amount of the awards that people will be receiving, uh, assuming they qualify, and we're going to get to that, uh, is based on uh, the salaries and benefits from April 1st to September 30th, 2019. Applications can be submitted now, and I have clients that have submitted applications already. To receive ASAP approval, completed applications should be submitted no later than April 3rd, meaning that Folks, if you don't get your applications in by 5 p.m. on April 3rd, you're at the end of the line. A lot of these applications are going in right now. And I, I think anybody who's on this call needs to submit it because your employees, our employees, if you will, I mean, we need to get that money in their hands. Um, Treasury's going to provide a web-based program to submit the applications. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't wait for that. But if they do have it up, I haven't checked in the last hour or so, but if they do, that's great. Uh, applications received after 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on April 3rd, we considered, but not be approved as quickly 
And for the folks that are thinking, I don't know if I want to do this, anybody submitting an application after April 27th uh, may not be considered. And why are those deadlines and times so important? Um, I'll give you just some rough numbers. We've been working on this you know, constantly for the past few weeks. Um, and and more, more importantly, after the regs came out or the guidance came out. So you know, I, I know the numbers that we have as 135 operators are big numbers for that time period. But to put it in perspective or the airlines, the top five airlines, what they're likely going to apply for if they do indeed apply. Alaska, their number is going to be approximately 1.1 billion. Frontier, 1.5 billion. Southwest, 1. Point, or excuse me, 4.2 billion. American, 6.5 billion. Delta, 5.6 billion. United, 6.1 billion. Guess what that adds up to? 25 billion, roughly. You see where I'm getting at? There's going to be a scarce pot of money here, and that we need to act fast and make sure that we indeed. Dot our I's and cross the T's. Next page, please. So some of the key definitions here. It's a little bit different than what we normally refer to. Um, so air carrier, same meaning as uh, Title 49. We should all be fine there. Employee means an individual other than a corporate officer, interestingly, um, who's employed by the air carrier contractor. So pretty straightforward there. I think we all can figure that out. Passenger air carrier, this is kind of a unique definition that they threw in there, but uh, you have to be derived by more than 50% of your air transportation from transportation of passengers. That may knock some people out because, uh, you know, I, I, I just think about that. So don't assume if you do a lot of non-passenger uh, transportation. And I would say this does not, uh, just thinking out loud here, this probably doesn't apply if you do a lot of 91 ops. So think about that. Wages, salaries, benefits, and other compensation, pretty straightforward. Um, and I like that it's pretty broad. So that should help a lot of folks. Next slide, please. So just like everything else and the guidance that we've been receiving, we've been watching every time uh, Secretary Mnuchin opens his mouth. We're trying to get all the information, read the tea leaves to figure out what's going to happen and, and what happens or what, what, what the government's looking for. And basically, we we'll try to get the money out to clients hands as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, understanding that this is a scarce pot of money and a lot of folks are going after it. You have to make certain assurances. Uh, Got to use the money for what it's for, employee wages, salaries, and benefits. And refrain from involuntary layoffs or furloughs, reduce any pay, benefit, or salaries until September 30th. Interestingly, United has said publicly, that's fine, but we are making no promises after September 30th, 2020. So, folks, if you read if you read this, uh, the, the meaning behind this, the airlines are thinking that this is going to be a long term issue that we're dealing with. Uh, when this subsides in the United States, and God, I hope it does soon, it's going to it's going to run rapid all throughout all throughout the world, Central and South America, India, Mexico, everywhere else. So, think about that. That's think about what it's going to do to air transportation. Um, other assurances may not apply to most of us on the call but uh you know no, no chair buybacks um you know you, you and the, the last two things um you know, applicant or subsidiary you, you you can't do anything out of the ordinary here and the last bullet there um you know you're not going to pay any dividends i don't think many of you guys do that anyway but to the extent i don't think there's any if there, if there are publicly traded folks on the call um you know, no, no dividends, share buybacks, none of that stuff. This is basically, uh, you know, you, they're going to put some some restrictions on you. Next slide, please. Other assurances. So, uh, certain limitations on employee compensation uh, only goes to uh, the the people in the payroll, and then there's specific exam or specific restrictions relating to um, salaries and bonuses and total compensation. So if you're one of the executives, you, you see that more in, in the corporate world with large, large corporates, but, um, you know, and, and, and we can get into specifics or I'll send you the, the guidance specifics. Basically $350,000 is a threshold um, and a $3, $3 million is another threshold for that. Basically 
you can't use this money or you can't not even use this money, but you can't give your executives, the highly compensated folks, um, large bonuses, stock awards, salary increases, et cetera. They want this money to go to the employees and it should not go to the executives at the top. This is what uh, is, is getting the most questions, I think, the highlighted section, taxpayer protection. Uh, what does that mean? Good question, because I don't think anyone really knows at this point, but uh, you know, as it says, Treasury Department is authorized to receive warrants, options, preferred stock debt securities, notes, financial instruments issued by the recipients of the payroll support, which in the sole discretion of the Secretary Department or Department uh, Treasury Department, provide appropriate compensation to federal government provision of payroll support. You could look at every one of practically every word in there and wonder what the heck does that mean? Sole discretion, I'm pretty sure what that means. It's the sole discretion up to the Treasury Department. Appropriate compensation, we don't know what that means. But at the end of the day, it, it, it means that um, the secretary is going to look at that specific provision in terms of whether or not um, they're going to seek equity. Uh, in 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 the case of the uh, in the case of the 9/11 uh, bailout bill, the government did indeed receive equity in the airlines, and they profited to the tune of approximately 300 million dollars. So. What's different about this time is that the airlines, the major airlines went in pretty healthy. I think a lot of them had billions of dollars in cash. They did tons of stock buybacks. We had the corporate tax break in 2017. So they're in a very different position. So I don't know how they're gonna handle that. I know publicly Boeing has said they are not interested in doing anything if it involves giving the government equity. So how that plays into us, maybe a good thing. If one of these folks walk away from this, who knows? But in any event, that's something to think about. Insolvency. This is what really concerned me when I read through these things. You know, some of you folks that are on the line may be proactive and say, heck, what the heck? Um, you know, I want to figure out how bad is bad. So there's an actual provision in this guidance that says Treasury Department may refuse to provide payroll support to applicants that have taken or are currently evaluating any action to commence bankruptcy or insolvency filing in any applicable jurisdiction. Um, so that's a bit, bit disconcerting there. Um, what does that mean? How you've been doing it? Not sure, but uh, I've looked at the applications. The application's pretty straightforward and doesn't provide for anything like that in there. So that may involve uh, another aspect that we're going to get to, and I'll, I'll get to that after this one. Uh, next slide, please. So the insolvency. Uh, certification may be involved in this document right here, the payroll support agreement. So you submit your application, um, it gets tentatively approved, the government's going to send you back this document right here, a payroll support application. It's going to be provided by the Treasury after the application is received, excuse me, after it's received, not necessarily approved. Payroll support agreement will include the following terms. The, assur the assurance is described above, we just mentioned, the compensation limits, they're going to say, hey, look, if you got a, an executive there, you got to cap their salaries. Certain other conditions and covenants. That's what I'm unclear about. So, um, like I said, we do have clients that have submitted already. We're waiting to see what that payroll support agreement looks like um, and what exactly these conditions and covenants provide. And then, obviously, if, if something goes wrong, you don't use it for payroll or some other thing. The government does have the right to claw back that money and rest assured they will call back, claw back that money. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, you know, I hear the question all the time. What are our chances? Well, applications will be determined based on the following. Eligibility of the applicant, adequacy of the government, excuse me, adequacy of the proposed financial instruments provided, co providing compensation to the federal government, the availability of funds, applications willingness to be bound by the payroll support agreement, and purposes of the act in determining whether or not to approve the application. So, um, having going through this, having gone through this, this will be my third uh, crisis, 9-11, 08, 09, when I interpret this, I mean, it means that the Treasury Department has absolute discretion how to disseminate these funds. There are no, there is no appeal process. Um, they are going to give the funds to whom 
they think has the best or the, the highest need and the government's payback. It's unclear whether or not or how that's going to impact um, impact us in the 135 world, but I absolutely think we ought to seriously consider and apply for this program because if you don't apply, you definitely won't get it. And if you do apply, at least you'll be able to evaluate what the payroll support agreement provides and um, you know give some give some hope to to our employees out there that are desperately in the needs of, of, of some funding because we all know uh, the world was very different a month ago and it's going to be very different a month from now. And so the folks that prepare uh, the most will be the ones that are in the best shape getting out of this. We will get out of it. To the extent that this program, and I know this is outside the topic, but to the extent this program doesn't apply, there's also the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. That's for small businesses under the 7A. I'll just mention it briefly. It's mentioned under the 7A program. It's a great program to to try uh, to get. That is going to be the you know the 349 billion dollar program. That's the primary focus of Treasury Secretary Mnuchin's comments. He wants to make sure that small businesses are taken care of. Um, those are supposed to be same day loans. You fill out your paperwork. It's an application. It's only basically two pages long. You walk in. You walk out with the money. That's the best case scenario. Um, what is hidden in there that they didn't tell you is that if you look at what the lender's guidance is, and we received what the guidance that the lenders received, uh, there is a provision in there that if you're hiring somebody to work on your behalf, they get paid uh, out of the bank's fees, kind of like a realtor, if you will, um, to split the fees. So based on certain loan amounts, uh, it's graduated for the smallest loans. The banks are going to get a 5% fee. doesn't come out of your money. Um, a little higher than that, 3,000, 350,000 and up, it's a 3% fee, agent fees goes down. So if you're thinking, oh, gee, I can't afford to hire somebody to do this, there are some relief available for the folks out there, that particularly the smaller businesses that, that can't afford it. So um, that's it in a nutshell of these two programs. I know there's more to discuss and I'll throw out their last two things that, that we've been talking about internally. Um, you know, Again, this is a very trying time. I think that stay on the lookout for additional guidance regarding employee concerns, employee relations concerns. More specifically, if your pilots or staff members uh, are asked to fly into a hotspot, what do you do about that? Uh, be concerned because there's guidance. You got to have guidance. You got to have a plan for that because folks are saying, I, hey, I, my guys may not want to fly or my gals may not want to fly in certain areas. Be prepared for that, absolutely. And secondarily, be prepared for situations and take utmost cautions because, you know, pilots are getting affected too by this. Pilots, you know, I know it goes without saying, but hey, pilots do get the coronavirus and they do not have symptoms sometimes. So be careful because worst case scenario, you do not want to have be in a position where your flight crew are giving it to the to the uh, the passengers in back. Per, utmost precautions, sanitize, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's all I have to add, and I really appreciate everybody joining this because I think this is a very important program. I think everybody should apply, and I think really, you know, we need to get this money out to our workers because no, no one wants to do a layoff. I'm sure of that. So uh, there'll be questions afterwards. But again, thank you so much, everyone, and I'm going on mute. Thank you, David. Uh, John McGraw. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, Actually, John, so this is Jackie. Oh, yeah, I'm Jackie, gonna, go ahead. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump the line here and cover the uh, federal excise tax holiday briefly. Um, okay. Part of the CARES Act, we decided to move this in uh, after David's discussion, since that's uh, another part of this act, is the FET holiday, and the law defines that as the period beginning after the date of enactment, which was March 27. It is a holiday for the transportation of persons and property, um, which is the 7.5% seg uh, and segment fee, or the international facilities fee for passengers, the six and a quarter for um, property for cargo. Um, and it does not ap apply to amounts paid prior to enactment, is the language that, that's used in the uh, that section. There is also um, a tax holiday for the commercial aviation fuel tax, which is the 
4.3, 4.4 cent per gallon tax uh, that as a commercial operator you pay. Um, and you can get a credit back when you apply for, when you buy the fuel at the FBO, you're typically paying the non-commercial rate. And right now, usually on your 720s, you're applying for a fuel tax credit and you get back, if you paid 24.4 cents per gallon, you're getting 20 cents back, leaving you paying the 4.4 commercial aviation tax. That 4.4 is what is being uh, waived at this point, and that is going to be able to be treated as non-taxable use. We're going to need some specific guidance from the IRS on how they want you to obtain um, that credit. I, I'm, we're suspecting it's just going to be your, you'll file it as a non-taxable use on the 720, where instead of getting 20 cents back, you'll get the full 24.4 back. That has not been stated by the IRS yet, so we're still awaiting some information from them. But in the interim, uh, the, the recommendation from us is to make sure, as you always do, when you're buying fuel, from the FBOs that you're keeping track of how many gallons are used in a commercial use, how many are non-taxable, so that you can apply for the proper credit uh, when the time comes. All right, and John, since I jumped in front of you, I will uh, I will toss it back to you now. Can I just add one okay. thing get here real quick? Sorry. Uh, Absolutely. That, that, it says KRC, it does not apply to fractionals. So fractionals, you still have to right. figure out that 14.1. Right. It is not a holiday for that, um, that surcharge. Perfect. John? Yep. All right, Ryan, thanks. And uh, no worries, uh, Jackie, uh, that's good information. If we could go to the... Oh, there we go. Okay, we got the next slide up, um, folks. Just so you know, the the uh, uh, as an, the industry has been going to FAA since this started, and and the realization um, became clear that we were not going to have business as usual from the FAA. Uh, they have been reaching out to industry um, as the industry has been reaching out to them to figure out how to keep business moving, how to keep how to keep the uh, the system operating. Um, as part of that. Uh, there are a number, uh, I think the latest count, there were 32 different issues uh, that were being tracked uh, by the FAA and, and the uh, industry folks involved to try to get relief from some of the requirements, particularly things that are time-based and require the FAA to be a party of, of the, you know, to complete the task. Um, the, the first couple of, uh, and, and let me just say, there are several ways the FAA can do that. Some rules that are in place allow for deviation. So some, some of the, uh, not only the rules, but the guidance will allow for and is written up front to allow the FAA to deviate from the normal uh, deadlines. Some, reg some rules do not. So some rules um, require an exemption, which is normally a pretty long drawn out process, uh, which um, the FAA has used in, in some of these. And then there are some other uh, uh, ways, some other uh, policy statements that they've done that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But, um, the, the first tranche of these, there were, there were two that came out reflecting um, 135 training, um, one that, that uh, allowed for alternate ways uh, and, and relief from the requirements for crew members to use oxygen masks. Um, and then the second was for uh, recurrent training and qualification activities, which uh, gave an extension uh, so that uh, people that can't get check rides uh, that they normally would get would still be allowed to continue to operate. So that's the A and B here that you see listed. And um, the, uh, the, the, the FAA also did, at the request of A4A and others, uh, did a part 121 uh, exemption for each of those. So there's 135 and 121 exemptions for those two categories. Um, and that's what you see here where it says commuter CA4A exemptions. Um, on the medical front that lagged a little behind these first two exemptions, the uh, the first thing you saw on, on FAA medicals was a statement that was a little unusual. It's a compliance and enforcement policy statement that is now in the Federal Register that essentially says the FAA is not going to, um, not, is not going to uh, do any surveillance or any compliance and enforcement activity if somebody can, that has a current medical continues to fly past its due date. Uh, due to coronavirus. So um, 
Uh, that, of course, that kind of, of compliance and enforcement statement doesn't change the requirements. They're still there. So, so the medical is technically not uh, current, but the FAA says if you're going to operate in the U.S., we've determined uh, that it's safe for you to continue to fly and we won't do any compliance and enforcement. Uh, you, won't get, uh, you won't get a letter or you won't get any kind of fine. Um, which is which is okay uh, in the U.S. Um, they would it certainly would not be able to do that once they put this in the Federal Register. There have been a lot of questions around uh, this statement because it's a little unusual. It's not an exemption that would actually change the requirements. Um, FAA now that that's only good for domestic operations. So FAA followed up with another exemption that um, is for international operations. So during this time, if you if, you're, uh, if your medical has uh, expired, but you have to fly internationally, uh, the fact that the FAA won't do any compliance and enforcement doesn't hold any water with the international regulators. So uh, they did an exemption, the 2020-0317, uh, that international operators can use that actually changes the requirements for the medical to allow it to still be current internationally. Um, why the FAA chose that strategy, I'm not sure, but uh, I may find out uh, at in about um, 30 minutes, um, we have a, a weekly call with uh, Ali Barami, who's the head of aviation safety, and his team to talk through all the activities they have underway um, and uh, and go through the requests from industry. Um, there have been other things, just examples of things. There's uh, some guidance out on pilot schools uh, and training interruptions and how to handle that from AFS 800. Um, AFS 200 uh, sent a, a, a deviation. Uh, paper out on uh, Part 142 Training Center certificate holders. Uh, there are a, a bunch of designee oversight and training and currency requirements that have been either uh, had a deviation or a waiver uh, published. Um, there's some guidance for repair station folks. There's some guidance on how to use technology during uh, inspections and tests. So they're trying to look on the aircraft certification side of how they can um, use video and other means to show compliance, for instance. Um, so, so there's a bunch of that to take advantage of. And I have to tell you, it's coming out, it's coming out uh, sporadically, but but more and more frequently because they're, they've been working on a lot of this stuff and it's just starting to emerge. This week is a big week for a lot of these documents to come out. So my best advice to everybody is please um, watch the NATA coronavirus resource page for announcements. We, we also, of course, send out uh, NATA news announcements and a bunch of other documents that, um, that will have announcements about this stuff coming out. But we're trying to compile as much as we can, as soon as we can on our resource page. So uh, take advantage of that. And then if you have questions, of course, or if something you need to do doesn't fit the mold of a lot of the guidance that's coming out, if it's an unusual case, uh, feel free to contact us. We're glad to go back to FAA and see if it's uh, something that they can tackle on a one-on-one -on -one basis or whether they need to publish something broadly for the rest of the community. Um, I would also advise not worrying too much about the deadline, um, uh, the extension timeline as we move along. Um, they had to pick a, an extension time, so 90 days from when a check ride is due, for instance. Um, if, if we get to the point where that 90 days isn't enough, uh, it'll be very easy for the FAA just to change the timeline. That will require a lot less of a process for them. Uh, I think they'll be able to manage and stay ahead of those deadlines as uh, as this thing continues to develop. Uh, so with that, let me uh, let me pass it back off, Jackie. Thanks, John. Yep. So this next slide, Employee Matters. I mean, this is really the slides intent is just to stir thoughts internally within your operation. Um, the essential employee, you know, again, that's still federal guidelines, but it is state by state. Um, on our website, we have a template uh, for essential employees. Uh, it's a document, you can put your information in there. Um, we also have health screening forms, in essence, pre-flight health screening forms um, uh, for the operation. So if you are continuing to do flights, you can get your passengers to fill these out um, and have internally. Um, this mindfulness of transmission between pilots and passengers, you know, David and I spoke on this a little bit yesterday. Is there any more, I know David, you referenced a little bit on it before. Is there any more you wanna add in that area? 
Yeah, the only thing, if I if it does occur, um, talk to your insurance provider um, and just assess whether or not there is some potential risk for a claim. Um, you know, we are all in uncharted territories here, but uh, you know, worst case scenario, God forbid, someone dies um, and they claim that hey, we got this from from our pilots or crew. That's that's very speculative. That's, I mean, who knows how people are getting this at this point. But uh, certainly be on the lookout again, be proactive. We're in a very mm -hmm. trying time and the more proactive you are on every level, including this, um, talk to your insurance provider and just stay ahead of it. Thank you, David. Um, flights to and from hotspots, as, as David mentioned before, you know, your pilots may not want to perform these flights. How are you going to handle that internally? Um, we've been getting reports uh, that Florida DOT has been uh, has a, a health mandatory self isolation form that some FBOs at some airports are, are uh, pushing out and some aren't. Uh, so we're actively flushing that situation out. Again, you can always um, access this new information through um, nata.aero, our website. So lastly, I think we need to get into the questions. There's our email addresses. Um, Jackie, do you want to take over the questions? Sure. Let me uh, let me start with uh, going back to questions that are more uh, relevant to David, and then we'll move into some of the FAA side of things. Um, how would a small company put up financial instruments instruments to satisfy uh, the Treasury's requirement? Um, there's a, several questions related to that. Um, and you know, are we are we aware of anything? If we if a 135 operator doesn't offer some sort of equity stake, would they be denied? How do you think that'll play out? Yeah, I mean, I I I, I can't really. I mean, that's very speculative. Um, every every 135 operator is in very different position. You know your own needs and circumstances. Um, all I can say is talk to your accountant, talk to your attorney, and discuss the issue generally. Um, you know, there may be some people that say, I'm not going to put up anything to get money. There may be people that say, I'm going to put up a lot. I just don't know. And I've been reading, you know, every time one of the airlines says something or someone discusses on this topic, it's all over the board. But I would say, short answer is, um, talk to your, your legal counsel or talk to your um, uh, accountants specifically about this because it is it, it is in the act and um, you know you, you you have to read exactly you know when you when you fill out these forms you have to answer them and the best guidance you have is what the questions ask for so um, that, that's that's my short answer I know it's 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 kind of frustrating but I you know I can't really give um, guidance legal guidance to to 200 plus people um in a you know a minute or two questions so um <laughs> take it from there thanks so related in related to that same thing is the issue of there's there's this the one program that's directed at carriers and then there's also the sba program would you see there being um, a reason why you couldn't try and and do both or that you would do one over the other no i don't so again you, you look at your circumstances and um, the various pots of money. We're talking a pot of 25 billion um, versus a pot of 349 billion, but the entire country is after that. I, the short answer is no. I, I don't think of any reason why you can't, because the the worker, um, the air carrier worker support program doesn't say you cannot apply for any other program. I will say though that the um, the payroll protection program does indeed say you can't apply for multiple payroll protection loans. So that's actually explicitly in there. I will say though, um, there are other programs out there in the small business realm that do have restrictions. So bear in mind, if you do apply for uh, the payroll protection program, you need to again, talk to either your accountant, your bank, or your legal advisor, because if you do apply for this program, other programs are out there that specifically note, you cannot apply for other programs if you've applied for another SBA program. So bear that in mind. 
And I think in that same mind, uh, same line of questions there, what I'm hearing you say, and it's kind of indicated in a couple of these questions, is that we should go ahead and apply, see what comes back, and then you're not under an obligation just because you applied to finalize it. So you may you may decide that with the terms that come back and the, the documentations that come back from your application that you don't want to proceed. Yeah, no, they, they, exactly. I think the key is, so in terms of gross numbers, I mean, if you, if you run the numbers, the Air Carriers Workers Approval Program is much larger by a factor of you know, five, I think, or it, it's, it's a big number. We're talking millions. For, for the folks on the phone, you're talking millions, big numbers. Um, so that that's that's a no-brainer. If, if everyone in a perfect world, you said, look, I could get everything I wanted to, you'd absolutely go with the worker uh, air care workers pro program. The small business program is uh, is two and a half times, and um, yeah, they're they're putting some restrictions on now for non-payroll expenses. A capping it. it used to be complete loan forgiveness, um, but again, something is better than nothing. Everyone's going to apply for the, everyone that I've talked with um, is going to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program, without a doubt, and those monies are going to go by very quickly as well. Um, but everyone's situation is different. I would think that, uh, read the fine print, that's the key, understand what you're signing, and make sure that all the reps and warranties you have in there are applicable. You're not going to you're not going to have the issues of the major carriers, um, but um, you know, read through this stuff, make very informed and thoughtful decisions because you're only going to get one bite at the apple when you submit it. That's it, um, and so you can't. I, there's, essentially, there's no do-overs, and so make sure. And particularly if the in the in the, in the small business section sex seven uh, a payroll protection program. You're thinking, hey, I want to go after another disaster relief loan under the SBA provisions, and you accept this, you're going to be an issue. You're going to be an issue. But I guess to the to, to the point, Jack, you made, no one's going to, your government's not going to force you to sign a contract. They're not going to so force you to enter into this payroll support agreement. You're going to know what the terms and conditions are. Uh, you're going to know that, look, um, I'm, I'm not going to give up. 25% equity in my company. I'm not going to do that. And then you don't have to take the money. And that's a hypothetical. Um, this is a, a, an agreement, meaning that you have to agree and the government has to agree. And so they're going to give you their terms and you're going to get their terms. And so, and you're going to give them their terms. And so nothing's obligated. You're not obligated to do anything until you finally agree to what's going on. I will say this, when you submit these forms, you do have certain certifications that you have to read through and make sure that that you aren't uh, prohibited based on the applicable certifications or that you can comply with the certifications. Um, okay, that, that, that's about it for that, I think. Yeah. Are both of these programs um, forgiveness, include forgiveness, or are they treated separately once you receive the funds? Can they both be forgiven? Uh, for the Air Care Worker Support Program, yes. It's the grant, basically. Assuming you don't, assuming you comply with the terms and conditions of the program. In other words, you can't lay people off. You can't cut salaries. Uh, you, you, you can read through it and get the fine, fine, uh, finer points. Um, but again, these are common sense here. These are programs to keep people employed at specific levels. So once you take the money, you're obligated to, to. Um, to perform at those levels. And provided that you do so, they will be forgiven. Uh, I will say though, with the uh, I, with the uh, payroll protection program, that actually changed last night. It was 100% forgiveness across the board. Now it's a little bit limited, 25% will not be forgiven. Uh, it's not used for payroll, non-payroll uses. So something to think about there, again, talk with your uh, accountant or legal advisor on how exactly that means, meaning that if you have payroll heavy workforce, won't be an issue. You're going to burn through all that money on your payroll. But if your payroll is more in line, I mean, if your expenses are more in line with rent and other things, you need to reconsider or just bear in mind, you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay some of that back. Um, but again, talk to your, your, your attorneys, your accountants, et cetera, banks, 
and make sure that you know what you're signing up for, know what, what the obligations are before you agree to anything. All right, David, thank you. I'm just looking through here real quick and see if there's any other specific questions. Um, several questions that just you know, the, on the clarity of whether or not the air carrier grants are actually grants or or forgiven. And, and I think the point you're making there is that it, it is intended to be a grant unless you don't comply with the terms once you've received the funds, in which case then you would need to pay that back. Is that correct? That's That's absolutely correct. There are very I mean, we, we mentioned the assurances. There are other assurances in there that are less applicable, I think, to for our audience. But certainly, read through it. Um, they're do I mean, people are applying now. So, and if you don't apply by tomorrow at 5 p.m., you're going to be at the back of the line, and guess what happens? You're probably not going to get any money. So, um, I think I think that's the message to take away: is it's better to get the application in, and right. then make the decision when when it comes when they respond back to you. Absolutely. All right. On to, uh, thank you, David, on to some of the uh, more FAA related questions. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Jackie, could I, could I just, uh, there's one question that's been coming up pretty regularly. Um, is that what, what's the, what paragraphs are covered under the exemption that gives you the three grace months for, um, mm -hmm. for some of the training and checking events? Uh, on page six of the exemption, there are two little footnotes at the bottom. Yes. It's very important, and I might have put those up in the text, but they actually list all the paragraphs, and it does include 293A, which I've been getting a lot of questions about, and B, and a bunch of others. So, um, and two, yes, uh, your 299As you, are there as yeah. well. Yeah, those are all there. And so if you um, if you have any questions, those those exemptions are posted on the NATA resource page. Um, and so you can pull those off and you'll have them, you should have them in hand probably if you're going to take advantage of them and, uh, and look at the bottom of page six. That's where, that's where it lists what you're allowed to extend. Yes. The, uh, the exemption that is the, uh, 0292, it is, um, you're absolutely right, John. I, I mean, it's there, it's buried with this exemption, a total of three grace months are available. And the reason they did that here is because there's already a grace month provision. So basically they're extending the grace month provision for two more months. Um, are available to complete the requirements of 293A and B and 135-299A. And there's several others listed there, but those are the, the ones that we are getting the most questions on. Um, so that is in the exemption that is 0292 um, and that has the grace month on it. Those exemptions are one of the downloads that's available in your webinar uh, a screen there. And if, uh, if for some reason you're having trouble getting a hold of them, please uh, just visit the NATA website that you see listed there, advocacy slash coronavirus. They are there as well. Um, please make sure as you're getting these exemptions, you're aware of what your requirements are. They're not just blanket exemptions. You can't just start using them. You need to file what they're saying is, you know, a letter of intent in the docket, and that information is detailed in each of the exemptions. And then you will obtain um, an operation specification. I think it's A005 they're sending out for that. Um, John, in the phone call he has coming up here shortly, will be getting more information just to make sure that those are going to be expeditiously um, issued to operators when they are needed. Um, and then you have some requirements to do risk assessment and tracking and everything else. So please make sure you're, you're following the terms that are, are listed in each of those exemptions. Yeah, and if I could, Jackie, there's a couple other sort of common themes. Uh, there have been questions on drug and alcohol testing. Um, we, we queried the medical office and FAA about it. Of course, it's not directly their program, but, um, but the um, DOT has put out some guidance on um, how to manage unusual circumstances like this one for uh, potentially delaying availability of people for drug and alcohol, uh, that sort of thing. And the FAA uh, has, a, has a link on the, the, what we posted to our site uh, for questions. So if something comes up uh, and you have a question about it, you can go directly to them and they're trying to answer those. But we haven't seen a, a waiver or exemption that just says, don't worry about it for 90 days. Um, and that's good, but that's going to be one of the questions we're going to be asking uh, in about uh, 15 minutes with the FAA. 
So uh, they continue to go back on some of these and try to get them clarified. Yeah, there there is some information on on the drug and alcohol testing. It really kind of points you towards, um, you know, if you had your random pool and someone came up and the medical facility is not available, there's nowhere to send them to, then you would record that as an, you know, an inability to test. But there's not necessarily a blanket, don't worry about your random pool. Um, and so those are, but if, if there are specific questions, let us know if you have an issue and, and John will be following up with the FAA on that, um, on that area in particular. All right, let's see, uh, medicals for um, non-enforcement on that issue. So the important thing to remember on medicals, the, the non-enforcement issue is for pilots and it is for the pilot to be operating domestically. The exemption that the FAA has put out there, um, and they gave us one, and they, they did a, a, a corresponding one to A4A for the 121, is for you as the carrier to be doing international operations. Um, so that's what allows you to do international. I would. Yeah, check you. Oh, you know, I, I would. I would make sure. Obviously, if you're just doing domestic operations, you don't need to use the exemption for that purpose. But as a carrier, you should be tracking your pilot's medical and when they expire anyway. And I would add to your record keeping, even if you're not doing international and therefore you don't necessarily need the exemption. Uh, I think best practice would be, you know, my favorite saying is, you know, he who has the most paperwork wins. So make sure you are keeping track of that. Make sure you note that the medical did expire, but that you're following the non-enforcement provision. John, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the FAA still, again, this is an oddball way to handle this from an FAA. So we're going to ask about it, but I think the FAA, uh, you know, looks at the operator to maintain the safety of the operation, and they want them to have some look at uh, if a pilot's medical is expiring, make sure there isn't some underlying medical issue that you, you know, if it obviously has something wrong, um, you, you should probably just be asking questions and writing down um, how you determined that it, the risk was okay for a particular operation, et cetera. Uh, the, the advice on keeping good paperwork is a good one. I don't think the FAA is going to try to come after anybody unless they did something intentional or heinous in this environment, but, um, but, but it's good to keep the records. Yes. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Is the uh, health questionnaire available on the NATA website? Yes, it is. That's under the uh, business resources section on the, uh, that website. Um, on the taxes, lots of tax questions. Um, the segment fee, uh, the segment fee is waived as well. That is part of the uh, 4261, I believe, is the uh, code section. That is all waived. So that section includes the 7.5%, the segment fee, the international facilities fee. So all three of those are waived by that, um, by that portion of it. And then the 4271 is the uh, cargo section. Those are, that is waived as well. Um, you know, some very specific questions on uh, the excise tax side about the applicability to block time and the applicability to other things. I, the way that it is phrased, I, I can only tell you how it's phrased. I am not a tax attorney, um, so I cannot give you ex ex exact advice, but I will have, um, I'll include with the, uh, on the NATA website, a highlight of the section that, um, that addresses the FET. And it basically just says that there's no tax applied for the tax holiday. We still have to wait for some guidance. In, and somebody did ask the question. I didn't want to get too down in the weeds, but somebody asked about the difference between, um, you know, the 4.4 and the 4.3, whether the lust fund will be waived or not. We're still having to pick through the, the details of it. But the bottom line is, is if you keep your detailed records of which gallons were used commercially and which were used non-commercially, at the appropriate time, either on probably more than likely your quarterly 720, you will be given guidance. The IRS will put out instructions in amending the form or something like to that effect that will tell you which which fields to fill in. If you're familiar with that form, it's uh, Schedule C, I think uh, line five and A through E are the different places where you would apply for a credit. 
So we will get more information on that from the IRS, but the important thing right now is to make sure that you're keeping those detailed records of, of what fuel you bought and how it was ultimately used, whether commercial or not commercial use. And I am just quickly scrolling through here to see what other questions we have. Let's see, while well, we still got about 10 minutes to go. Jackie, I don't one. I don't think we've covered. There's a couple of questions about Part 91. Um, that that relief for Part 91 operations have, has been a request from uh, the early days as well. I, I think the FAA is focused on, you know, sort of triaging this into 121, 135, and then they're getting around. I think now to looking at the Part 91 and what they're going to do with that. Um, we're we're hopeful they'll follow a similar path uh, in getting those through, and you would hope that as they have been able to get these through, um, the um, the others should be able to follow through much more easily as far as the getting getting uh, reviewed through the government on the way out. So we're hopeful, and I'll find out again in about uh, nine minutes what the status of that is, and we'll let everybody know if there's any development. And I have a reminder from our, our good friend Eileen Glimer that if if your pilots are in that circumstance of um, taking advantage of the non-enforcement for medicals, to make sure you're at least broaching that with your insurer to uh, to verify that there's not going to be an issue with any of your coverage. Because as John pointed out, the, the medical has still technically expired. Um, and that is a concern people have. So make sure you're talking with your insurer to, to make sure things are still going to be um, covered appropriately. Thanks, Eileen. All right, let's see, we had a, oh, we had a security question, the 12-5 uh, recurrent training. Um, there is nothing that I have seen yet, but we will follow up on the, the TSA front for that training requirement. Um, some things that have been waived, the Real ID Act has been pushed back for compliance, and the, um, the requirement for the ID that's presented to be unexpired. So if somebody has a driver's license that has expired this month or next month, um, you can still accept those. But um, that's a good question on the 12-5 the recurrent training. I'll make a note of that, and, uh, and, and we will pursue that with uh, TSA and see what their thinking is on that. Yeah, Jackie, I have a call with TSA later today as well, I hope, and uh, I'll raise that question also. All right, Ryan, I think, uh, I think that is about it if you want to bring us home here while uh, we are still under our time limit. Well, Jackie, thank you. David, thank you. And John, always uh, appreciate uh, uh, jumping on and, and look forward to getting that feedback today from your calls with the FAA and, and TSA. Again, we're here to support you guys. We're going to get through this. Um, please email us questions, concerns. Um, happy to dig into whatever we need to be doing. Um, again, we're here to support you. Thank you for joining. Stay safe. And we'll talk soon. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, John, Ryan. Jackie. Thanks, guys.